So what I want to do in this video is give ourselves an overview of cellular respiration. And it can be a pretty involved process. And even the way I'm going to do it, as messy as it looks, it's going to be cleaner than actually what goes on inside of your cells and other organism cells. Because I'm going to show clearly from going from glucose and then see how we can produce ATP through glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. But in reality, all sorts of molecules can jump in at different parts of the chain and then jump out at different parts of the chain to go along other pathways. But I'll show kind of the traditional, the traditional narrative. So we're going to start off with, for this narrative, we're going to start off with glucose. We have a six carbon chain right over here. And we have the process of glycolysis, which is occurring in the cytosol, the cytosol of our cell. So if this is the cell right over here, you can imagine, well, the glycolysis, the glycolysis could be occurring right over there. And that process of glycolysis is essentially splitting up this six carbon glucose molecule into two three carbon molecules. And these three, these three carbon molecules, and we go into detail into another, in another video, we call these pyruvate. Pyruvate. And in the process of doing so, and this is, I guess you could say, the point of glycolysis, we're able to, on a net basis, produce two ATPs. We actually produce four, but we have to use two. So on a net basis, we produce two ATPs. And I'm going to keep a little table here to keep track. So we produce two ATPs. And we are also, we're also in the process of that. We reduce two NAD molecules to NADH. Remember, reduction is gaining of electrons. And you see over here, this is positively charged. This is neutrally charged. It essentially gains a hydride. So this is reduction. Reduction. And if we go all the way through the pathway, all the way to oxidative phosphorylation, the electron transport chain, these NADHs, these, these, the, the reduced form of NAD, they can be then oxidized uh, to provide, and in doing so, more energy is provided to, provide, to produce even more ATPs. But we'll get to that. So you're also going to get two NADHs. Two NADHs get produced. Now at that point, you could kind of think of it as a little bit of a decision point. If there's no oxygen around, or if you're the type of organism that doesn't want to continue for some reason with cellular respiration or doesn't know how, this pyruvate can be used for fermentation. And we have videos on fermentation, lactic acid fermentation, alcohol fermentation. And fermentation is all about using the pyruvates to oxidize your NADH back into NAD so it could be reused again for glycolysis. So even though the NADH has energy that could be eventually converted to ATP. And even though the pyruvates have energy that could eventually be converted into ATP, when you do fermentation, you kind of give up on that. And you just view them as waste products. And you use the pyruvate to convert the NADH back into NAD. And then glycolysis can occur, glycolysis can occur again. But let's assume we're not going to go down the, the fermentation pathway. And we're going to continue with traditional aerobic cellular respiration using oxygen. Well, the next thing that's going to happen is that the carboxyl group, and everything I'm going to show now, it's going to happen for each of these pyruvates. So you can imagine these things all happening twice. So I'm going to multiply a bunch of things times two. But what happens in the next step is this carboxyl group, this carboxyl group is stripped off of the pyruvate. And it essentially is going to be released as carbon dioxide. So this is our carbon dioxide being released here. And then the rest of our pyruvate, which is essentially an acetyl group, that latches on to coenzyme A. And you'll hear a lot about coenzyme A. Sometimes they'll write just you know, CoA like this. Sometimes they'll do CoA and then the sulfur connect, uh, bonded to the hydrogen. And the reason why they'll draw the sulfur part is because the sulfur is what bonds with the acetyl group right over here. But when, so you have the carbon dioxide being released, and then the acetyl group, the acetyl group bonding with that sulfur. And by doing that, you form acetyl CoA. And acetyl CoA, just so you know, you only see three letters here, but this is actually a fairly involved molecule. This is actually a picture of acetyl CoA. I know it's really small, but hopefully you appreciate uh, it's a more involved molecule that the, the acetyl group that we're talking about is just this part right over here. And it's a coenzyme. It's really acting to, to transfer that acetyl group. And we'll see that in a second. But it's also fun to look at these molecules. Because once again, we see these patterns over and over again in biology or biochemistry. Acetyl-CoA, you have an adenine right over here. It's hard to see, but you have a ribose. And you also have two phosphate groups. So this end of the acetyl-CoA is essentially is essentially an ADP. But it's used as a coenzyme. Everything that I'm talking about, this is all going to be facilitated by enzymes. And the enzymes will have 
we'll have uh, uh, cofactors, coenzymes, if we're talking about organic cofactors, that are going to help facilitate things along. And as we see, the acetyl group joins on to the coenzyme A, forming acetyl-CoA. But that's just a temporary attachment. That the, the acetyl-CoA is essentially going to transfer the acetyl group over to, and now we're going to enter into, into the citric acid cycle. It's going to transfer these two carbons over to oxaloacetic acid to form citric acid. So it's going to transfer these two carbons to this 1, 2, 3, 4 carbon molecule to form a 1, 2, 3, 4 five, six carbon molecule. But before we go into the depths of the citric acid cycle, I want to make sure that I don't lose track of my accounting. Because even that, that step right over here where we decarboxylated the pyruvate, we went from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, that also reduced some NAD to NADH. Now this is going to happen once for each pyruvate. But we're going to, all the accounting we're going to say is for one glucose molecule. So that for one glucose molecule, this is going to happen for each of the pyruvates. So this is going to be times, this is going to be times two. So we're going to produce two, Na, two NADHs in this step going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Now the bulk of, I guess you could say, the, the catabolism of the carbons or, or the things that are eventually going to produce our, our ATPs are going to happen in what we call the citric acid or the Krebs cycle. And it's called the citric acid cycle because when we transferred the acetyl group from the coenzyme A to the oxaloacetic acid, we formed citric acid. And citric acid, this is the thing that you have in lemons or orange juice. It is, it is this molecule right over here. And the citric acid cycle, and it's also called the Krebs cycle, when you first learn it seems very, very complex. And some could argue that it, it is quite complex. But I'm just going to give you an overview of, of what's going on. The citric acid, once again, 6-carbon, it keeps getting broken down through multiple steps. And I'm really not showing all of the detail here. All the way back to oxaloacetic acid, where then it can accept, an, it can accept the two carbons again. And just to be clear, once the two carbons are released by the coenzyme A, then it can, that coenzyme A can be used again to decarboxylate some pyruvate. So there's a bunch of cycles going on. But the important takeaway is as we go through the citric acid cycle, as we go from one intermediary to the next, we keep reducing NAD, NAD to NADH. In fact, we do this three times for each cycle of the citric acid cycle. But remember, we're going to do this for each for each acetyl-CoA, for each pyruvate. So all of this stuff is going to happen twice. So for, we're going to go through it twice for each original glucose molecule. So here we have one, two, three NADHs being produced. But since we're going to go through it twice, and we're going to do the accounting for the original glucose molecule, we could say that we have six, Na, six NADHs, six, or you could say six NADs get reduced to NADH. Now you also, in the process, as you're breaking down, going from, going from the six carbon molecule to a four carbon molecule, you're releasing carbon as carbon dioxide. And you also have, traditionally, GDP being converted into G GTP, or sometimes ADP converted to ATP. But functionally, it's equivalent to ATP either way. So we could also say that we're going to directly, remember, we're going to do all of this stuff twice. So we, we could say that two. Two, I'll just say two ATPs to make it simple. We could say GTP, but I'll say two ATPs. Because once again, this happens once in each cycle, but we're going to do two cycles for each glucose. And then we have this other coenzyme right over here, FAD. That gets reduced to FADH2, but that stays covalently attached to the enzymes that are facilitating it. So eventually, that's being, that's, that's being used to reduce, to reduce coenzyme Q to QH2. So I'm just going to write the QH2 here. But once again, you're going to get two of these. So 2, 2, Q, 2, QH, 2, QH2s. Now let's think about what the net product over here is going to be. And to think about it, we should, we should just, we, we'll just, and uh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a shorthand. We'll go into more detail in future videos. Is these coenzymes, the, the NADH, the, the, the QH2, 
These are going to be oxidized during oxidative phosphorylation or, or, and the electron transport chain to create a proton gradient across the inner membrane of mitochondria. And we're going to go into much more detail in the future, but the, that proton gradient is going to be used to produce more ATP. And one way to think about it is each NADH Each NADH is going to produce, and I've seen accounts, and it depends on the efficiency and where the NADH is actually going to be produced, but it's going to produce anywhere between two and three ATPs. The, each, Q, each, of the, each of the reduced coenzyme Qs, so the QH2, that's going to each produce about one and a half ATPs, and people are still getting a good handle on exactly how this is happening. It depends on the efficiency of the cell and what the cell is actually trying to do. So using these, using these ranges, actually I'll say one and a half to two, one and a half to two ATPs, and these are, these are approximate numbers. So let's think, about, let's think about what our total accounting is. So if we just count up the ATP or the GTPs, we're going to get two there, two there. So we're going to have four direct or very close to direct ATPs net being created. And then how many NADHs? We have two, four, and then we add six. We have 10 NADHs. 10 NADHs. And then we have two of the coenzyme Qs, two QH2s. So that's going to be four ATPs. This is going to be between This is going to be between 20 and 30 NADHs. Uh, sorry, 20 and 30 ATPs. 20 to 30 ATPs. And then this is going to be 3 to 4. 3 to 4 ATPs. So if you add them all together, if you add the low ends of the range, you get, let's see, 20 plus 3 plus 4. That's 27 ATPs. 27 ATPs. And the high end of the range, let's see, you have 4 plus 30 plus 4, you have 38, 38 ATPs. And 38 ATPs is currently considered to be kind of the theoretical maximum, but when we actually observe things in cells, it looks like it comes out at around 29 to 30 ATPs. And this, once again, it depends what the cell's trying to do, the type of cells and the type of efficiency. But all of this is happening through cellular respiration. And just to get a better sense of where all of this is occurring, where all of this is occurring, we said glycolysis is occurring in the cytosol, the citric acid cycle, this is occurring in the, in the matrix of the mitochondria, so this space right over here. That is the citric acid cycle and that little magenta space that I've drawn. So that's the matrix, the video on mitochondria. We go into much more detail on that. And then the actual conversion of these coenzymes of uh, you know, the electron transport chain, that's occurring across the membrane of the crista. And the crista are these folds, for, uh, these kind of inner membrane folds of our mitochondria. So it's occurring across that, across those, the membranes of those, of, of these, Of, uh, actually, the, the plural is Christi. Christa is, a, is the singular of the Christi. And we'll go into more detail into that in other videos.